Making pots on a wheel requires many hours of training. Probably comparable to learning a musical instrument and playing it at a professional level. So it's something you have to practice regularly for several years before you truly master it. To design something like a teapot, you've got to make it a hundred before you really understand the form and the process. first stage is to center the clay, to get it to run true. It's not a brute strength, it's a kind of intelligent strength and a sensitivity that you need to acquire or, or practice. You will use your thumb or your forefingers to open it up and then pull it out, making the base of the pot. You then lift the clay, making sure you don't open the body too wide. You always move it towards the center. And then for a teapot, you need a good bit of clay at the top so that you can make the gallery for the lid to fit in. And then the next stage is, to, is really to shape the pot to the form that you would like it to be. And then usually your final movement, you'd use a tool, a wooden or a metal tool on the outside just to give it a smooth finish. Taking care not to overwork it, so you know, for a handmade pot you'd like to preserve that feel of, of movement. The most important tools for a potter obviously is the hands and the brain and the eyes. But for certain aspects of the making process you need tools. You need some round edges and you need some sharp edges and you need some flat edges. Each potter has their own tools, their own preferences. Again, it's, it's very much a, a personal thing and it's interesting to look through the tools of, that potters have used traditionally and how, how little it's changed over a, a history of thousands of years. It's good practice to make the lid straight after you've made the body because as water evaporates, the body starts to shrink. This time you just push your fingers down slightly off center and that will give you the knob for the lid. If you make the lid at an angle, roughly judging with your eyes where it should be, then take your calipers, measure it to the lid and then you could adjust it by only just either pushing the walls down or up and that would give you the correct size. Eventually you become so accurate just by sight. Measuring often is just a formality. I would usually make a batch of spouts at the end of the day so after you've done the bodies and the lids. Throwing off the hump, as they call it, I mean, that's been in practice for centuries by potters all over the world, especially from the East. You can just make the spout off one large body of clay. It's an efficient way to make a lot of small things quickly. If you're an experienced potter, you, you've trained your eye to kind of see more or less what's the right size. In many ways, your body is, is the measurement. It's made for another human who also has more or less the same size hands and number of fingers as you do, and so it's quite intuitive. Usually the pots are allowed a few days to dry evenly, and then they're ready for the next stage. So once the pot's leather hard, you want to trim the excess clay off the bottom of the pot, refining the shape, but also ridding it of any excess weight.
especially in the case of a teapot, which obviously you want to keep as light as possible because it's going to be filled with hot tea and you want to make it easy for the user. It's very important to keep the walls of the pot as even as you can. That increases its resonance, its strength, so that it's less likely to chip or to crack in the making process and when being used. Every pot we make is stamped with the maker stamp. The next stage is to attach the spout and to make a handle. So making the holes for the tea to flow using a sharp implement. Um, in this case, this is a porcupine quill from Africa. To join the body in the spout, the first thing you do is just to, to brush a bit of slip, which is basically just made from the same clay as what the pot is made. And that would help the spout to adhere to the body. Attach it carefully to the body, taking care not to, to mess around with it too much. The top of the spout needs to be cut at just the right angle so that when the tea is poured it does not drip from the tip of the spout. In everything a potter does there's always the functional aspect as well as the aesthetic. There's lots of different shapes of handles. I prefer to just go for the, the simplest form. You pull downwards and shape it into lugs about half the length of what you want the handle to be. You then attach the lug to the body and then you just proceed again to shape the handle. You want there to be a harmony in the shapes and the forms. And so. Once the handle has been pulled and attached and attached to the base, it's shaped in such a way that the angles on the handle echoes that of, for example, the spout, giving it balance. And so also you don't want the spout to protrude further than the handle. There's a lot of aspects to consider in making a teapot. Obviously there's the practical, the function of the piece, so you want it to work well. You want to create something that is functional and looks beautiful, and that's the challenge. So once the handle's been attached, the pots are just allowed to dry. It takes a few days to a week. At this stage, we'd fire it in an electric kiln. We call it biscuit firing. And the biscuit firing, we go to about 950 degrees centigrade. That rids the clay of all its molecular water and organic materials, and it physically changes it from what we would call clay to what we would call ceramic or pottery. The reason we, we do a bisque firing is really just because it mitigates risk. So the risk of pots blowing up in the kilns and then, you know, damaging other, other wear in the, in the kiln. Uh, again, it also just makes handling the pots easier when, when we're glazing and decorating them. So the leech pottery is still a working pottery of a small group of craftsmen working in harmony, essentially, to produce a, a product. Really trying to stay true to the traditions of good art and good craft whereby in order to make a good piece of work it takes a tremendous amount of practice, dedication and really learning and acquiring the knowledge and the understanding of all the processes that you are involved in, in making a bowl or a teapot. We're very mindful of continuing that aesthetic that Bernard Leach had brought from the East, the beauty of imperfection, of making things by hand. You have a personal connection between the maker and the user and I think that's, that's very important in our modern world where everything now is almost made by machine.
people I work with and the things that we do here and the way we approach our work to me is as valid as anything that somebody does who has their work hung in the, the galleries of the capitals of the world. Glazing a pot essentially is just melting a layer of glass over the, the clay, the ceramic body. I'm going for a very basic decoration using a brush and some iron oxide, which is essentially just rust. And then over that I will apply a glaze. The purpose of that is, is both aesthetic and again functional. The glazed surface is much easier to clean and it adds to the overall aesthetic of the piece. Essentially glaze is a recipe of minerals put together for a particular type of clay. Feldspar, clay, quartz, ash, various kinds of metal oxides for colour. There's such a wide range of different glazes available. So obviously again that's a decision that you have to make. The pot is still porous. The water is then drawn into the pot and the glaze is left on the surface. That's allowed to dry and then it's placed in a, in a kiln and then fired up to temperature. The final stage in the making of a pot is the glaze firing. You essentially give your work to the fire and your skills and your knowledge is judged. Any mistakes that you've made up to this point will now be revealed. It's very important to pay attention to the sounds, the smells and the colours of the flame. You're always mindful that it's not all about you. You know, you feel like an agent of nature rather than, than a creator. There's so many factors, the materials and the combinations of the materials and the fire that play a part in creating this piece. And that's a kind of humbling but enlightening part of what we do. So after two days of cooling, you get to open the kiln and hopefully there's a beautiful gift from the fire. Your labor is rewarded.